All right. Welcome to We Are Libertarians. My name is Chris Spangle, and uh, we are a podcast found at wearelibertarians.com. We have a network of podcasts. If you're not familiar with us, you can subscribe to all of those at wearelibertarians.com. And I am a I've been in the Libertarian Party for about 10 years. Uh, let me give you a little bit of my background for all of you bias hunters out there. Uh, because there are going to be a lot of people who are who are where well, where does this host stand? He's talking to this person and that person and uh, trying to determine how I feel about Ron Paul. Uh, and let me tell you, so I was a Republican growing up, and I uh, had all like many of you had so many of my beliefs broken down, and I became politically homeless. And I then heard Ron Paul in 2008 during the debates. Uh, speaking about non-interventionism, and that was the final piece for me uh, to become a libertarian, a full-fledged libertarian. I then went on to work for the national, or not the national, the state lo the state libertarian party, the Libertarian Party of Indiana, as their full-time executive director for four years. Then went on to be the marketing director of the Advocates for Self-Government for a year, and now I work elsewhere in a non-related uh, radio capacity. But I started this podcast in 2012 because I felt that it wasn't always uh, worthwhile to work within politics. I felt there needed to be a cultural component to libertarianism that people could easily grasp onto the, our ideas. And we do this podcast, a uh, group of friends out of Indianapolis have for almost six years now, and uh, it's a lot of fun. So I invite you to subscribe, check out our podcast, our other podcasts uh, at wearelibertarians.com. I try to be very fair-minded. I try to be... Uh, nonpartisan. I try to be open to uh, many different views. I, I, I find that there are many different paths to libertarianism. There are many different ways to contribute to the libertarian movement, and we spend far too much time beating each other up because uh, of failed purity tests. I, I posted a status today saying essentially that I think l the Libertarian Party thrives on these these. Uh, a lot of what we're talking about today are internet fights <laughs> and revenge on each other instead of working together. So uh, please, if you would, share this video because this is a hot topic. Um, we're going to talk to uh, Daniel Hayes, who is on the convention committee. I believe he's the head of the convention c committee, and he's been at the, chair. the committee chair. Thank you. Uh, he's, he's in the background. You can't see him because I have a... Uh, uh, I don't have the best setup, but I have a setup. So you'll see him on the screen to my left, and we'll hear from him in just a moment. But I wanted to set up this issue. He's been, Daniel's been at the uh, center of this controversy that launched uh, just a few days ago. And uh, for those of you who are of the blessed few in the libertarian movement that have not heard about what is happening within the libertarian movement, let me explain to you what's going on. I'm going to read, to to set it up, I'm going to give you where it all started, the, the Mises Caucus, uh, the chair of the Mises Caucus. I, I hit up Michael before we started this to ask him uh, how to pronounce his name, and we may talk to him after I talk to Daniel. He he had to do a couple interviews, but I feel he, he represented his views very well in this article at lpmisescaucus.com. And he writes uh, in an article titled, LP Convention Chair Just Rejected Ron Paul and Judge Napolitano from National Convention. Um, it's a pretty sad day, he writes, when the Libertarian Party rejects Ron Paul, the godfather of the modern libertarian movement. But unfortunately, that time has come. As many of you know, the LPMC has never been shy about our goal of shaking up the leadership of the party to give it a fresh look and principal direction that the majority of libertarians would be motivated to support. In fact, it is our major, our first major milestone goal. We know that this would draw the ire of party leadership and its supporters, however we feel, as most libertarians do, that it is badly needed and much overdue. I'm not going to read all of this. I'm going to read some of the parts that I think are highly relevant. Uh, and so I'm going to skip this next paragraph. Having established this working relationship with Mr. Hayes, I decided to follow up and inquire about what we would have to do to get Ron Paul and Judge Andrew Napolitano to the convention as speakers. It doesn't get more libertarian than that. I had the pleasure of discussing the caucus and our goals with both Dr. Paul and the judge at the Nexus Conference in September. Both expressed interest and support, so the potential was there. 
Mr. Hayes made it clear that the party would not be willing to pay any potential fees that may come with such AAA speakers. I told him that we would work on taking care of the fees. He was very interested in having the judge out, but oddly uh, seemed to be lukewarm about having Ron Paul speaking at all, regardless of fees, without having expressly denied him at that point. He then goes on to say that he uh, suddenly got a message from Mr. Hayes. Uh, that conversation took place in October, uh, Michael Heiss said. Uh, it was just an idea, and he then said in December he got a message from Daniel Hayes. The article he linked, written by Dr. Paul, titled, Good News, Young Americans Want a New Political Party, has the following passage in it, which seems to have outraged Mr. Hayes. Unfortunately, the Libertarian Party has failed to live up to what should have been its role as an ideological alternative to Washington's one-party system, Ron Paul writes, as was quite obvious in 2016 in the presidential election where uh, Gary Johnson and Bill Weld ran. The Libertarians yielded the prevailing attitudes on war, welfare, the Federal Reserve, and more in believing that winning was more important than standing for something. They ended up achieving neither. I would still like to have some hope for the LP, but to really fill its role as a challenger to our two-party system, that is actually a one-party system, it would need a major overhaul. It would need to actually embrace the core libertarian principles of non-aggression and non-intervention in the affairs of others. Um, he uh, Then Daniel goes, or not Daniel, Michael goes on to write, there is nothing untrue about that statement. Uh, he there there are some screenshots which we'll we'll get into that Michael sent me. Many of you have seen on what I will describe as the nefarious Liberty Hangout, or as someone on Twitter called Diet Right Hangout, which uh <laughs> made me laugh. Um not a bastion of libertarian journalism. So in October, uh Michael and Daniel had a conversation um, uh, Daniel wrote, so yeah, if they can get Ron Paul to come, we will cover his expenses and give them a table. Then Mises Caucus can sponsor a table. Michael writes, let me make some calls, but I think we'll be able to get this done. Uh, then he, then uh, Dan Daniel said in an October 19th message, that said, if you can get Ron, as in cover his honorarium, I can cover his flight room and give him a gold ticket. Basically, you guys are paying him to come represent us, and we are covering his appearance. Michael writes, right. Uh, that's very pitchable to redacted. Very libertarian, Michael. You're redacting secret information. I'm going to turn into Edward Snowden, hunt you down. Uh, can they get a table if they commit to this? Uh, Daniel said, I think I can get that done. Uh, now, in as many people have seen, in some places, Daniel... Uh, Daniel, the convention chair, later on in December, sends this article and just highlights those portions of what he said. Michael, the head of the Mises Caucus, decides to let it go for a bit. Uh, about six weeks, after about six weeks, I got back in touch with the representative who maintained an interest in making this happen. I decided to follow up with Mr. Hayes, head of the convention uh, committee, at, who at first saw my messages, then very unprofessionally ignored them, ultimately giving me a thumbs up when I said, I'll just tell him you aren't interested. So unfortunately, that is exactly what I had to do. Mr. Hayes, who claimed Dr. Paul, has, quote unquote, no idea what we represent, ironically asked me for my opinion on, and support on courting Glenn Beck hey, as a speaker to the convention. Wait, let, me, let me interrupt that for a minute. Uh, 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 I'll give you a chance just here in a second. Um, because, because that's not what it said. Dr. Paul has no idea what the LP represents, not what we as libertarians represent. That's a very important distinction. Well, we'll, we'll hold on just a second, Daniel, okay? Okay. Uh, um, so then Michael, for his, his part, goes on to promote the Mises Caucus and says you should keep being interested and participating in the Libertarian Party because there's no point in fleeing the Libertarian Party because then you can't change it. On that, I think everyone agrees. Instead of throwing a hissy fit on social media and stomping your feet like a little child, if you want to actually see the Libertarian Party, you should get involved, which is for my my message here. Uh, now, let's go to Daniel. Daniel, uh, Daniel Hayes is on the line. He is the chairman of the convention committee. And uh, Daniel, can you kind of give us a brief background of who you are and what you do in the Libertarian Party? 
Okay, so I became politically active in 2011. I got involved with the Ron Paul campaign. Um, I ended up being the uh, vice chair for Congressional District 1. Louisiana uh, was using a strategy of uh, getting control of the delegates to the Louisiana State Convention with the intent of putting Ron Paul delegates in that slot. We controlled four out of six uh, delegations. We won those. Uh, we, we got a lot, a lot of things done, but we basically got infiltrated by the GOP, um, and that's a whole other story. But that's where I got involved. Saw the saw the sausage made in the GOP up close, and didn't want to be involved in that. So, always been a philosophical libertarian. Um, the, the the switch over to the LP was was um, pretty easy. Uh, and what years is this? Know, it was obvious. Okay. You had a question? Yeah. What year was this? Uh, 2011, 2012. Okay. So I switched my voter registration um, after basically uh, it was it was clear that uh, you know what we'd done with the Ron Paul campaign had been um, compromised at the very least here in Louisiana by, in my opinion, was the 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 leadership within the campaign. So um, and, and then plus what the GOP did for, did like I said that's a whole long other story. But but I got involved with the LP. Um, Actually, for six, eight months, whatever, so said, no, I don't want to be part of any kind of party leadership. We got involved in forming parish executive committees here in the state, and we formed one in my parish, Jefferson Parish, uh, which is, you know, that's what us civilized people call counties, people that don't know what parish is, <laughs> is a right. county. And um, so uh, April of 2013 was when I became, got my first official title. Um I serve uh, on the Louisiana State Central Committee as a representative for Jefferson Parish, still do. Um, I went to my first convention, 2014, um, sitting behind another uh, a state chair, kept turning around to me. And he was running for Congress, or he was a former state, he was a delegation chair. And he said, why are they telling me what I, this was during platform, why are they telling me what I need to think as a candidate? And I was like, I'm with you, I get you. I mean, it's like, I mean, honestly, um, for those people out there, my idea of the libertarian platform, delete the whole – every plank, leave the statement of principles and the omissions plank 4.0 that says just because we don't talk about it uh, doesn't mean we, we approve of it because uh, I think that's really the libertarian thing. That's my views. Like I said, I, I find it kind of ironic that we spend so much time telling people how to be a libertarian. But anyway, so because of that, that same person during our caucus um, turned around to me and said, if I nominate you, will you run? Had no plans on doing it, and I was like, okay. Came very close to um, actually ending up as the rep from, from uh, by t within two votes um, for Region 7. Um, but, you know, the, the person that ended up that, we had a very close working relationship. It was good. So I ended up being the alternate. That was my uh, involvement with um, the LNC. Um, jumped to the 2016. Uh, I was involved in uh, putting on the convention. And in, in Orlando, uh, along with my mentor, as far as doing conventions, Betty Rose Ryan, who's done a lot of very successful LP conventions in the past. So um, with that particular involvement, you know, we, we I, I was a big advocate for getting this next convention uh, here in New Orleans, that being our midterm, because my idea, my, my feeling was for conventions uh, during our off years, we, we need to go someplace people want to go to. And, uh, you know, New Orleans is a destination city. Organizations that set conventions here have been known to set records and break records all the time. You know, presidential years, it's, it's less important. Hey, there's a cat there. Sorry, um, but yeah, sorry, Muffins is getting involved in the controversy here. <laughs> you know, it, these things happen. Um, that's, that's, that's why I'm sitting in this room. You know, when you start talking, they're all like, hey, what's going on, Dad? What's up? <laughs> you know, and I was like, I'm going to the library because otherwise my big shepherd that, that's like up to my waist would be like, you know. Up in our up in our business, um, so but anyway, putting on that putting on that um, the convention in New Orleans uh, during an off year that was something I advocated very heavily for um, the the you know not because I live here but because but because I live here and know what New Orleans brings to organizations that put their conventions here that being success you know as far as like a a, a presidential year I, I feel like the location is is less important. 
as long as it's got the proper facilities to handle our needs um, cause, because people are more interested in that. Um, that that's the reality. Um, politics doesn't does, is not uh, just on that one particular cycle. In fact, I wish everybody would quit looking at, you know, quote unquote, supreme overlord and run for those smaller offices. But the, the, the reality is that's what interests a lot of people. So anyway, we'll get a lot of attendance. For that. So, so that said, um, I'd like to say, um, and by the way, if you see in the background, that's uh, the convention website, libertarianconvention.org, um, with regards to the 2018 convention. And uh, pretty much as of February 1, uh, you know, we had a lot of concerns because audiovisual costs and things like that and other costs I'm putting on, putting on conventions have continued to rise, and it's, it, it's, it's kind of um, cost prohibitive. And uh, we have initially set a, a, um, some prices for the packages that were higher than the final price for a day, a day longer convention in 2016 for the super early bird prices. And, you know, some members complained, and I just really um, went to the committee and said, look, guys, we need to, we need to look, at, uh, and look at, you know, restructuring the prices. And we had a vote on this and, you know, a big discussion, and uh, we did get that price restructure. And so jump to February 1st, you know, people were concerned that we wouldn't be able to pay for it by the number of people that come and attend and what, they pay, what packages they pay for. And jump to February 1st, um, this convention – is currently in the black. So this is on track to be the most profitable convention that the Libertarian Party has ever had. Um, we've never had a convention that's, that's I, I don't know if we've ever had one that's been in the black before, like the month before the convention. And, and this one is, is there five months ahead, ahead of that. Now, it's just all about, you know, money and, and, and you know, well, politics is about money. Um, and, you know, we want to put on a good convention. We want to have biz business. We want to put on things that are exciting to where we can inspire and educate and motivate people. But if this convention can help to bring money into the LP, then that helps us help our candidates, help our affiliates, and help the party grow. And, and so there's been a lot of that that's going on. The, the, the party has become more organized. People that have been involved heavily with the LP, um, they – they realize that this particular iteration of the LNC, the Libertarian National Committee that runs this, is much more functional other than a couple of things, and we get along much better than previous ones. If people think the things going on now are, are, are bad within the committee, they, they, they really need to talk to people that are around in past history. So we've been getting a lot of things done. Uh, donations are up. Uh, you know, we, we've got uh, a great head of development, Lauren Doherty, one of the one of the staff members that that the LNC hired. Uh, she's tremendous. She's she's really does a great job of of developing relationships with donors, members, etc. And, and so she's been a tremendous asset. Um, now, so my background, like I said, I, I'm I'm chair of actually on the LNC. Uh, I'm still involved at my local. I'm a local activist. I do lobbying up at the state capitol. I'm on our state central committee. Um, I'm, a, I'm a, a, a treasurer of the Louisiana Association of Parliamentarians. I'm the uh, president of, of my local METER unit. And um, then as far as LNC, I'm, I chair our affiliate support committee. I, uh, when Betty Rose Ryan had to step down for personal reasons, she's still active and she's still a consultant. I actually talk to her fairly frequently uh, for historical reference, etc. But she had to step down, and then I was the vice chair of the convention committee, and that's the point at which I stepped into the role of being the chairman of it. Um, from the initial start, I was the uh, speaker coordinator, which is what I had done in 2016. Uh, people felt like things went well with that, and so I, uh, I was going to continue in that respect. What happened, though, with, with we had this budget, and there was a lot, a lot of concern that, you know, are we going to pay – Pay for this convention, or is this going to, convention going to be a loss? Because that's actually happened a few times, and um, so you know, we this convention team has worked very, very hard to to one be frugal, and two, um, you know, make it pro make it profitable, bring in lots of revenue, make it, and while still making a good, exciting convention, and. Uh, you know, it's set up to be one of, the, like I said, one of the best attended conventions we've ever had. We had a room block of 1,018 room nights when we first got it from the Hyatt. It is currently, uh, I'll get the next pickup report uh, this week, but it, at, at last Saturday, uh, it was 1,088 room nights that we had booked. 
Hmm. It's set to be a very, very well attended convention. Things are going really, really well. So, um, you know, this this thing with the speakers and the controversy, the budget that I had to, with which to use for speakers was for a national convention uh, somewhere around thirty five hundred bucks. Think about airfares. Think about things like that. That's not a lot of money. Sure, and I've seen Ron Paul request thirty thousand dollars. I know uh, you mentioned Glenn Beck at one point. The LPIN had reached out to him, and he wanted one hundred eighty thousand dollars and a private jet. How long ago was that? That that was years. I, that was years ago. Yeah. I, see, here's the thing. That was Fox okay, News very, days. That's an interesting one because because you know and look and, and this whole thing is like you know oh the convention committee chair wants Glenn Beck over Ron Paul. Look, I, I mean I've met Glenn Beck multiple times, and. No, real nice guy. Actually, he's very, very. Um, he, if you see when Nick Sarwalk was on his show, he's holding a piece of paper with our with, with our platform and statement of principles, and he's like gushing. He's like, "This is beautiful." He's very, very, very complimentary towards the LP. You know that said, I uh, you know I, he he I, to my understanding, I think he, he's he wants to come to this convention on his own dime as a speaker. What it cost that. So consider that with what they said to you in the past. But that's my, my understanding. I think that was what was on the table. Well, and the, the odd thing about it on- is, and let me just, you know, sure. I Glenn Beck, I have followed him. I met him back when I worked in talk radio and have followed him for a long time. I, th- I promote his stuff because he has a really good, very libertarian prep staff. I mean, there are things that where we disagree with him, but there are a lot of things where mm-hmm. we agree. And I think part of the problem with most libertarian party folks is that they are looking for the places where they disagree with someone instead of where they agree because they've been so burnt in other parties and by other ideologies that they're very scared of that happening again and Beck has moved over the last four years uh, since the Fox News days in a very libertarian direction and one of the biggest episodes of We Are Libertarians was titled Is Glenn Beck Welcome and because he was four or five years ago trying to make overtures to the party and it was it was very clear for most people that he's not welcome here and there are a lot of people who were in the tea party at that time that got the memo that they weren't welcome and that's part of the problem it's judd weiss is called the libertarian party uh, dog kennel where you have this nice little sweet puppy who wants to get involved and then you throw them into a dog kennel with wolves and then they just get their ears bitten so many times they leave After three years, and I've seen that so many times over the last dozen years that I've watched the LP. And Beck is one of those people where we have a lot in common, and so I understand the the desire to have him speak, and he's somebody that I'm willing to listen to. Uh, I mean, you don't have to you don't have to buy in. And people who criticize Glenn Beck go back and look at some of the conspiratorial stuff that he used to say on Fox and CNN, and it's like, well, Ron Paul was on Alex Jones all of the time, (laughs) you know, like. That that's part of the libertarian thread is that our leaders and our our people will look at things and try to think out loud about more controversial stuff and I I don't, I don't get it I don't I don't get the impulse to throw the baby out with the bathwater water on anybody because it's 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 bizarre to me so did is Glenn Beck coming to speak. Uh, no, we never got to that point. Like you said, the, the, the thing that came up, when, so so I had been working with Mr. Heisey with the Mises Caucus, and we were having those discussions, and, and you know, uh, there was some, some, some initial, like, you know, animosity, because they, they, they're, like, they, they've got this very, uh, they're saying they want to form a coup. So that's what a lot of what's going on here, and let's, we'll talk about that stuff later, but, but this is about trying to make this particular LNC look bad and they're taking every opportunity to do so and there there seems to be this alliance and it's pretty apparent to people that are paying attention of which of this alliance is that really they dislike our current national state chairman Nicholas Sarwalk and they they are willing to do anything to get rid of him no matter what damage it does to the party but but as far as so Mr. Heisey though you know we kind of I kind of sent him a little trolling comment because he sent me a friend request and I was like, hey, so you're ready to get a table, blah, blah, blah. And, he, and he's like, actually, yeah, we are. So we started actually having some discussions, and we started talking. And, I mean, I, look, I was very complimentary of him. He got me in touch with, with Mr. Um, Jim Cantrell, one of the founders of SpaceX, current, current CEO of Vector Space Systems, who is scheduled to speak at our national convention. 
And, you know, Mr. Cantrell is an incredibly impressive person, and his topic is going to be something along the lines of technology versus tyranny, how, you know, space and technology are the answers to the current woes of the erosion of liberty that people are experiencing. And so, you know, I'm sorry, I'm still a little boy, and, you know, that's, you know, the space geek and things like that, and get, that gets me excited, and I'm sure it gets a lot of the other guys out there excited. You know, it's, it's that gee whiz stuff. And so that was a tremendous uh, connection. And, um, you know, Mr. like I said, Mr. Cantrell was, expressed interest of getting more involved in all kinds of ways with the party. And that's something that we were very, very um, amenable to. And, and, and so we, we, really, we really hope that relationship grows. And, and that was really good. And I was, I was at a point where, you know, so Mr. Heisey came to me. Well, let me finish with the Glenn Beck thing. I, I, I said to him, I said, so what do you think about Glenn Beck? Because a lot of people were like, no, 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 no. And, and the Glenn Beck, he's had this offer out there for like 10 months. So this has been a long time. That he's interested in speaking. So, so months before Nicholas Sarwick even appeared on his show, and so he's be- definitely been very interested. And you know, I drove out to, to the studios when, when Nick was on there, and um, you know, Mr. Beck knew that I was a speaker coordinator, and we'd actually met a, a previous time in New Orleans. But uh, he came out, and he, you know, with a point because he wanted to meet me, and like his one of his uh, pr- promoters or or helpers came up to me and said, you're going to speak court? Yeah. So, you know, he came up and we talked for like, you know, five minutes about things. And, um, you know, it, so, so this has all been going on. And I'm very, very aware of, of the apprehension that exists within the party relative to Glenn Beck. There's a reason why he's not, if you go look on our website, there's a reason why he's not listed as one of the speakers because of that apprehension. And so this was me saying, so what do you think? And I asked Mr. Heisey about it. And so, so for people, there's people coming around saying, you know, we're, we're, we're taking Glenn Beck over Ron Paul. Well, if you look, Glenn Beck is willing to come for nothing, and yet he's still not there. Now, does that mean he's going to speak or not speak? I mean, that's something that, you know, there's people out there that's also acting like, you know, I'm just this, you know, uh, authoritarian making these unilateral decisions. And the reality is our convention committee, when they assign me to be the speaker, I'm the one tasked with basically <clears throat> organizing that. And when you have too many chiefs, it's hard to get things done. And, you know, so, so I've got a lot of authority relative to that, but I've got this sort of meter in my head. I'm like, okay, <clears throat> how complicated is this? Is the person coming for free? How, how well known are they? Are they, how well accepted are they in the party? And, you know, if, and even people that are, are seemingly well accepted, I have a tendency, you know, I get on, as you can tell, I talk a lot, um, and, and on our convention committee calls, and I say, yeah, here's what I'm doing. I even get into my thought process of why I'm arriving at certain decisions with, with regarding uh, certain things we've done. And so, like, relative to Glenn Beck, you know, it, it, they, he came up once with the convention committee, and then I brought it up again. I was like, so what do you guys think? And we started talking about it. And one of our members decided to go and post, which I really would, wish he wouldn't because it was an internal thing. And, you know, the, the, the committee basically, you know, they were like, no. And, and like I said, I'm, so this idea that I'm some kind of unilateral uh, authoritarian regarding this stuff, it's, it's just ludicrous. The- no, you work with my former boss, Sam Goldstein. <laughs> And Sam Goldstein's on the committee, and I can't imagine that Sam Goldstein would ever allow a dictator because Sam is uh, uh, a curmudgeon. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that, that's an excellent word. Excellent. I love I love Sam. He was a great boss. So, so let's let's get into the controversy because I sure. want to ask you. So, so you said that you went in to he sent you a friend request and you sent him a trolling comment previously. I mean, okay. did you did, you, did well, you go into see, here's, what here's was your thing. what was your relationship with him previously? I mean, were you going into it with some sort of adversarial attitude with the Mises Caucus? Um, well, the, the the Mises Caucus had an adver- adversarial attitude to to me. So it's so it's you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm I consider myself to be a bit of an empath, and a lot of times what people see from me is maybe a reflection of themselves. Um, you know, I'm you know, and let's not get into the whole whole aspect there. This was, when I say it was trolling, look, I, I sent it, and I was like, hey, you know, you're ready to, you know, do some things. And he said he, he was. So I was like, oh, okay. So immediately that, that, that fell away because it's like somebody's going give, to give the party, you know, some money, spend some money um, to, to get a table, do some sort of sponsorship or whatever relative to the convention. Then 
you know, this is about making this convention successful. And so, uh, you know, I, I then at that point was all in um, and, and endeavoring to work with, with the gentleman. And, um, you know, there was a point to where, like I said, after, after the experience with us getting Mr. Cantrell involved, well, I'm like, I look like I'm, I'm, I'm in a supernova there if you're, you're uh, I know. The, the screen you got behind me, but yeah. it is with this. <laughs> so anyway, we, but, but we, so, so that, we don't that have that reason well. or that Mises money. So we're, we're a we're small independent media. I, but. <laughs> I understand. So trust me, you know, the, the National Libertarian Party uh, has a ha, has a budget of what, like one point seven million dollars for a uh, for a, a national political party. You know, and right. so think, keep that people keep that in mind. You know, I've managed restaurants in the past that have that have had that kind of annual revenue that they brought in. So that's and why you should, that's why you wanted Ron Paul to pay his own way, or or you wanted the Mises Caucus to pay the honorarium. Well, you know, the see, money's just not there. Comes this. So so in 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 some of the comments that that I'd sent to Mister Heisey that. Are not in there, and, and frankly, I'm not looking. To, you know, I'm not really interested in you know screen capping and sharing some of them because sometimes you start talking about other people and other organizations and things like that, and those things should probably remain um, private. Uh, you know, when you're doing some sort of negotiations and things like that. But but I, I informed him. You know, what, like in, in the thing you read, that's me kind of. You know, that's negotiations and talking. But but a lot of times we'll do that, and it's it's with the understanding. I think and if and things like that, and sometimes. You know, I, I may have to check legalities on whether or not with the treasurer or a council, and I even voice it to them that, you know, on some of this more complex stuff, I have, have to come back, and I need to go back to the convention committee and um, – or maybe even speak to our council. That was a, that was one comment that I, that I had very early on. And, and this stuff is not always so cut and dry. We are a political party, and so how and where and we get money is something that comes under great scrutiny. And while I may even say, well, well, here's this, it's an idea, but before we can actually implement it um, and, and, and go forward with something, that's, you know, a lot of that stuff has to be checked because um, the reason we're here, government. You know, we can't just go out and voluntarily associate and say, here's what we're going to do. Well, you're going to do this, all right, blah, blah, blah. It's, you know, there's all these hoops and restrictions, and, and you know, you're never it, – it, it's really complicated, and you're not exactly sure what you can do a lot of times. And so I'm always, you know, looking at – looking, you know, I, all a right, lot let, of times – So let me, you know, let I, me I, cut I, you off there because okay. we get that point. Flat out, what is your opinion of Ron Paul? Um, I think Ron Paul – has been a fantastic statesman for um, for the Liberty Movement. You know, Ron Paul was the guy that brought me. But my experience um, in the past with some of the people surrounding Ron Paul has been less than desirable. And so actually there's a video response that was put out by Ron Paul just the other day. And if you watch it, you know, it's like, you know, he, he, the whole thing about, oh, you know, convention committee chair bans Ron Paul. Ron Paul is a lifetime member of this party. Ron Paul has absolute ability and, and right to come to the convention as a delegate. And then they say, you know, Ron Paul refused to speak. Well, you know, there's a lot of people that, you know, don't end up speaking uh, for whatever reason or another. And so this is a complex situation. Before Heisey even came to me and pitched his idea, I was had, had, had an idea of getting Ron Paul to the convention um, related to something going on with, with Dr. Walter Block, who's a good friend of mine. And, 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 and that got shot down by everybody. It was basically a, a three-way abortion debate with Ron Paul doing the, pro, the pro-life the pro thing. And I was like, whoa, okay. Was it, and, was and it was shot like, down because of the speakers, or was it shot down because it was about abortion? Uh, oh, let's make it clear. It was because it was about abortion. So, so the whole time I've been really amenable to this. Part of what's going on here, when, when, with, with, with Mr. Heisey, you know, there's, there's this whole thing. Like he, there, I've got a screen cap of him saying, you know, somebody says, how is the coup going? And he's like, it's working. So this whole thing, you know, I, I, I didn't just fall off the turnip truck. So I was working in good faith. But, I, I, you know, I always had this feeling. It's like, look, this is something that somebody is, is looking to use for some kind of political advantage. And, and I was literally at a point to where I was going to request with Mr. Heisey because we'd been working together and it seemed to mostly be going well. And, and I was thinking about asking him if he'd be interested in being um, my assistant speaker coordinator. And... You know, but then I saw some other, you know, rhetoric or, or ratcheting up of, of, of uh, stuff towards the, the, the LNC and the current leadership when we were supposed to be burying the hatchet. And however he got there, 
it was at that point I decided this is somebody that I really was not interested in working with. So why would you? So, why, so let me ask you, why would you send him a message in December with the Ron Paul article where he basically you know talks about how the current leadership so, of the party? I mean, being current leadership, you would you would probably take that personally. Uh, and and so, I would so say, he, like, he, they don't really need to do a lot to make the current leadership of the Libertarian Party look bad. So why would you, why would you, if you felt that he wasn't in uh, in your corner, why would you send him a so message again, giving him an now, ammunition? Now, now, you see, what I'm talking about, that, that decision of how, how I didn't want to work with him anymore, it was January. Okay. Okay. So, all right. So, so, so that's in the timeline there. And, and you know, in that article, he, he says, I unprofessionally ignored his his... his his meetings, even though I saw, well, you know, if you've got your, your computer open or whatever, or it's on that thing, I think a lot of times it'll so do think that person there. So, so just because somebody doesn't respond to you, I mean, do you have to act like some kind of stalker boyfriend and send somebody five messages within, within like, you know, two hours and going, Hey, Hey, Hey. And he sent the final message. That was something along the lines of, okay, Hey, I'll let uh, Ron Paul's representative know that, that you guys aren't interested uh, in, in having them at the conference, and I, I sent them, I sent them a little thumbs up as a response. And as I sent that thumbs up, I said, "Well, what I'm really interested in is not working with you anymore." And 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 look at the article. Find where I've ever said, other than that, where where I said I wasn't interested in having Judge Napolitano there. Because another thing about the convention, there are certain places where. Um, you know, you're going to put speakers in certain sorts of events, and with what was left relative to spots, there were, um, you know, another with regards to Ron Paul, I didn't necessarily feel like that they were the right um, places for him. And look, for example, uh, you know, uh, the spot I was interested in maybe having the judge at would be at our gala. Still, be, would be interested in having uh, Judge Apollo at, at the gala. Um, I just it's got to do with a certain dynamic and it's a matter of opinion and and people make decisions. But um, so you could see how you know, that th but you could see how that thumbs up is essentially an affirmation that you don't want Ron Paul. If he says, I'll tell them you're not interested. No, 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 hold no, on. Hold on. No, you, you, if, he, if he says, you, I'll tell Ron Paul's people that you're not interested and you give them a thumbs up, you could see how that he would take that as an affirm uh, an affirmation of what he was trying to say. OK, but but but, but, but once again. So people make decisions all the time, and there's a lot of things involved here. And with regards to what's trying to be done, the, the convention committee and our budget and the LP does not have the money, or it certainly did not have the money at that point to try and spend you know, up to $35,000 or $70,000 to have two speakers like that at the convention. Mm -hmm. And so just because we're making some – or I was making some sort of decision – uh, you know, one way or the other. And, and a lot of times I'll tell people something, and then when we have our meetings, I'll say, so guys, here's what I did, and what do y'all think? And I'll get the input from the committee. And, you know, I, I, I'm always willing to revisit things. And, you know, the main th the main point out of that, though, was 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 just Mr. Heiss. And look, look at the response there. Look at what he did, because I just said no thank you. Right. So, well, but I mean, is, is, would you would you, so so? And then, I and I will give you so credit. I will I, to in your defense, it isn't necessarily professional to take a screenshot and blast it out there. And 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 I asked Mr. Heist before this interview, did you? Are you the one who sent this to Liberty Hangout? Are you the one that you know? He said he had an interview with Reason set up. Are you the one that really pushed this story? And. Uh, I, so I have to ask you, there's only two people that could have put those screenshots out there and made this a story. Are you the one who sent screenshots to other people, or, in your opinion, was it Mr. Heiss? I, so people will have seen that recently I have been sharing screenshots of things. Um, I have not sent those screenshots to anyone. Okay. So before before that, so, so in other words, these are confidential negotiations, and sometimes, or should be, and sometimes things don't work out. Right. So in, in was your decision to really say no thanks to Ron Paul? Was it a combination, or was it a definitive part of the article that Ron Paul wrote about the leadership of the so, LP, or or was it more the relationship with Mr. Heiss had gone wrong? So, so um, you know, let me, let me find this particular 
uh, screen cap I have here in my phone. Okay, so this is from back in October. This is one that I've started sharing around in some of the various Facebook posts. Um, and I said, also, I've thought more about it. And since we have a video address from Ron Paul in the main hall last year, I would want to just focus on the judge. If Ron decided he wanted to come to the convention, I would work it out. But I don't want to seek him out since we did that in 2016 and he sent a video address. So, so what that means right there, and they keep saying, oh, that's October, and they're talking about stuff in November. You know, things change, and, and like I said, I see that. And, and, and the whole thing, I, I, I was, I'm not particularly interested for this particular reason, but just because the spot I've got, the spots I have open, this is not like Freedom Fest. You know, the Libertarian Party convention is especially about business. Now, I'd like to expand it and make it more than that, but there's a limited number of spots that we can have major speakers. People have this idea that we're going to have speakers wall to wall, but people are there at the convention mostly to do business, platforms, bylaws, have elections and stuff like that. And, and, and the speakers are a sideline. Now, I'd love for the Libertarian National Convention to be the premier liberty event every time it occurs in the country, and I think it should be, and it should be not just the people there making the sausage. You should have more and more people that are involved in coming and going to see the breakouts and going to see side things and people having to make hard decisions of who I'm going to see because it makes it that much more valuable when, you like, when you've got to weigh that, and it's just it's better for the overall uh, liberty movement relative to the Libertarian Party because we end up uh, you know, not just preaching to the choir. Right. So and, you, and I think so, that's, a, that's a really... All so, right. So ahead. you, and just a couple more questions on this. So you had indicated in October, before the sending of the article in December, that you were were more interested in the judge than Ron Paul. And then, yes. And then he wrote the article. What was your impression of the article that Ron Paul wrote, basically saying the Libertarian Party has failed to live up to what it should and 2016 was less than desirable for the party? So, so I made a comment that, that we, we referenced earlier and when I kind of interjected where Mr. Heisey wrote about it, and, and, and he used the word we. But if you look at the screen cap, I said Ron Paul doesn't know – I'm paraphrasing. I might not have it exactly right. But Ron Paul doesn't know what the LP is about. Now, is that saying Ron Paul doesn't know anything about libertarianism? Please, come on, really? The guy that brought me, okay? Come on. That's not what that says. When is the last time that Ron Paul has talked to a current leader of the Libertarian Party, the Libertarian National Committee? When is the last time he talked to our chair personally? So, you know, that's my point. Ron Paul's saying something, but he's hearing things from people. And I think a lot of it's got to do with his staff. And look, Ron Paul's, you know, he he's, he's deserves to be able to rest on his laurels from the past. But but the fact that he something like that is put out. There's an agenda being pushed. If you see, you know, that video response that was done with him, there seemed to be something pushed. And if you looked at the, at the way it was, it was posted, that, uh, Ron Paul is not getting on Facebook and posting things himself. His staff, the people around him are pushing a certain narrative that is not necessarily exactly what Ron Paul thinks. And so I have to say this. Look, and, and, and I even said it uh, the other day, if Ron Paul shows up at our convention – if he walked in the door and showed up at our convention and just said, hey, I was able to show up and I had no idea about it, I would probably say, Dr. Paul, I will find you a spot on, somewhere to speak to, to, the, to, the, to the body and work something out and get some kind of thing. Even if it was having him do an intro to one of the meal speakers when we were having, having a meal or something like that. Or, you know, we'd figure something out. And, and so, you know, Ron Paul is a member in good standing. He's got a lot of support. What, what we have here with this situation is somebody over t taking a few small snapshots of something that's been going on over five or six months or, or at least four months. I don't want to exaggerate over extended period of time and trying to act like this was just like, hey, you know, let's have this. And then we say no to Ron Paul and, and, and the judge. And like I said before. The judge, I have been interested in, never lost interest in him. I did, so there's a screenshot in there when I was like, hold on, wait a second. Um, I, I can't necessarily get involved with this because, you know, these are not the only 
people that we're pursuing. These are not the only avenues that we have. And this was a really complicated sort of a situation and possibly some quid, illegal quid pro quos with how you set it up. So it has to be done properly. And that's something that, that was, you know, made it, made it, th that's another factor that figures in there. So, so part of my thing is like, when I see this video, I'm like, this is not, not worth it. And I'm like, well, Ron Paul's out. That was me trying to say to him, let's quit talking about him and let's focus on the judge. We had phone conversations and I, and I said to him, I said, listen, no, I'm really interested in the judge. That's who I'd love to get. And in that article that Mr. Heisey just put out, he's saying, well, it's a package deal, Ron Paul and, and, and the judge. I think it's, it's something along those lines. You know, they, they, the judge is an interest in coming if his, if his friend Ron isn't coming. Well, how does he even know that? All right. Has so, that been... so let me let me yeah. let I, I feel like we've we've completely covered that. And I feel you've done a good job of making your case. And as. Paul said in the chat, you can tell that Michael released the screen caps because he's in blue. Uh, so I just want to ask a couple questions because you are on the LNC, and I've called for Arvind Vora's resignation. And as as Michael points out, Michael Heiss, the head of the Mises Caucus, basically says, we're, we're not focusing on purity, and that's why we're losing, which I will, after this interview, get into why, what is the tension between Ron Paul and the Libertarian Party, because this is not new. And I'll give you all the seeds of that. But uh, the idea of being pure and, st you know, going out there and beating people in the face with hardcore libertarianism. Arvin, Arvin Vora, the current vice chair, is obviously a proponent of that and is saying some pretty controversial things that, in my opinion, as I've said in my call for his resignation, does not move people to libertarianism. It moves people away from them. What is your personal opinion of Arvind Vora, and what is happening on the LNC in regards to Arvind? So, Arvind is an incredibly bright person. Arvind is super smart. Arvind uh, is really, really, really good at messaging. So, what he has done with the things he's done, he knows absolutely what he's doing. The, the thing about it is, and, and look, and, and, and I think that that is a bad uh, outcome for the Libertarian Party. And, and, and back up there, though, when you first started, did Mr. Heisey say we need to be pure, or is or is that Arvin, or is that a reference to Arvin? No, I think there, uh, and I, I, I don't want to lump Mr. Heisey in with uh, Arvin, but there, it, 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 there are two strains within the Libertarian Party. There's what I would call the pragmatics versus, versus the radicals. If you want to be very binary about it, obviously it's much more complex than that. Uh, but there, there are a group of people who, by and large, want to say the most, basically the most anarcho-capitalist thing you can. And that idea of saying what our vision of what we would look like at the end of our process, what the world should look like, will bring people to the Libertarian Party versus a group of people within the party who believe politics exists as it is now, and this is the framework that we work within, and how do we, how do we propose so, policy? And Arvin so, so is definitely in that, in that latter camp. In explain to me, though. So, I mean, you, you, you know, that's one thing that's had me very curious, because uh, isn't the Mises Caucus filled with people that are basically anarcho-capitalists? And so Arvin's basically advocating for getting government out of things, getting rid of government. And those should be positions that they agree, agree, agree with, even if he's expressed them poorly. And, uh, you know, so, so th this is not this is more of some some kind of gotcha type politics. This is about political advantage. There are people. I mean, if you guys don't see it, you know, this this whole intent uh I, I think uh, this last one has been engineered to, or or opportunity was wait, opportunists were waiting to try and make political advantage out of this, but at the expense of the party. In, in defense of those people, when Nick Sarwark, who I think Nick has functionally been a great chair, I think the office is operating as good as it's ever operated. I think that the hires that he's made at the party, along with the LNC, has been good, but Nick has these little snarky comments and he just seems to not be able to help himself and it makes not only him look bad but also the entire party and so when he makes these snarky comments against you know not only tom woods but also myself you know and jason stapleton and like the people who have the big microphones and you can't fight back and it and it's you can see how nick's comments about 
Tom Woods and the Mises uh, Institute, how that only contributes to this being a bigger deal. Because then you start to go, well, maybe I'm not welcome if I read Rothbard in the Libertarian Party. I mean, you're kind of the, the, they they do have somewhat of a point that the current LP environment there seems to be this attitude from the top that uh, you know while Arvin may be a purist, uh, Nick Nick is is certainly taking a shot at the more right leaning libertarians in the party. Um, and and I'm sorry to make you defend another person's statements, but. I, I think that's an important piece of this puzzle. So, so, so let's get into this. Is Tom Tom was an intellectual. I believe so. Yes. So, 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 what appalled me with Tom was with that Twitter fight, and 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 that said, you know, I don't think that whole petition or whatever. I don't think that was well conceived, and it just didn't do any good. But I, but part of Nick's thing was there was people that were conflating the the LP, especially with Cantrell and all that stuff that went down, conflating them with you know, the alt-right, the Nazi movement, and things like that. And he want, he felt the need to distance it. Did Nick do that the best way he could? No. But however, Mr. Woods is supposed to be an intellectual, and he sure did get down in the dirt. The thing that really got me wired with the whole situation when I saw it on Twitter was, you know, a guy that I, I, I arranged to pay to come to speak at the 2016 convention is, is, is you know, one, he's call, you know, this guy's an intellectual, and he calls Nick Sarwak a pansy and low IQ. Well, one thing about the people don't know about Nicholas Sarwak, Nicholas Sarwak went to college, I think, when he was 13. So for somebody to say that Nick's, that, that kind of ad hom, it's just, it's, you know, it's, it's not what should be happening. So, so there's bad behavior all around with this situation. And, and, and the fact that you pay somebody to come and speak and then they start, you know, talking, you know, negatively and say, don't donate to the party and things like that. Well, gosh, you know, it doesn't necessarily motivate you a whole lot to, to, to have that kind of experience again. So that's one thing that, that, that also affects, you know, some of the decisions we make with regards to, to speaking and things like that. Um, so, so on Nick, Nick and I, we have philosophical disagreements on things. However, I don't focus on them. Nick, Nick saw, okay, I, I'm going to, here's, here's some real blunt things. In 2014, I did not vote when, at my first LP convention. I did not vote for Nicholas Sarwak in the first round. I voted for him in the second round. In 2016, I did not vote for Nicholas Sarwak. There was only one round. That said, I was contemplating it, but I was involved with one of these caucuses that was coming in, and we're going to change things. We're going to take the party in a more professional direction. Yada blah 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 blah. And so, jump to Nick Sarwak. 2.0, that being this current term. And Nick started implementing things, hiring certain staff, and moving a plan, and moving the office in a direction that was absolutely where I wanted. And so while Nick is is sometimes snarky about things, because it's part of his personality, and I, I, I'm sure Nick sits there and thinks, eh, gosh, you know, maybe not. Um, or maybe he doesn't. But I know this mouth I got, you know, People have no idea how much of a filter I put on it, I'm, 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 you know, and, and it's still bad. And, and, you know, so so, you know, I said to somebody the other day, I'm a terrible politician. But one thing that I am is I will work my ass off for this party. I take so much of my time out to do this and I'm not asking for pats on the back. My reward is seeing us succeed. So as I see this party, you know, grow and the, re the revenue increases and, and things become more organized that's got me thinking we're going in the right direction and you know so, so somebody that was not you know fully in nick's court after this term i've made it very 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 clear that i am team sarwar i think nick is moving in the right direction he still has has room to grow but so do a lot of us and you know what he's brings to, people think that that the, the chairman of the Libertarian Party, all they do is talk. And, Chris, you know, because you've been an ED and things like that, you know there's a lot more to that role than, than that. And, um, you know, Nick, the, the, what he's been doing, he's taking us to the next level. And the thing about Nick is when he talks to, you know, um, you know major donors or media outlets and he's got his pro face on and stuff like that as opposed to, you know, the social media, it's, it, this thing's like a poison. It's, it's great, but it's, it's bad. When he does that, he inspires confidence in 
of, he of makes course, them think, you know, but, these guys are going in the right it, way. It, it's, Donald Trump would have a 60% approval rating if he just shut the hell up and stayed off of Twitter. And Nick Nick would be in the same position and has the same problem. And in the Nick, it, Nick would probably actually Nick would probably have an eighty percent approval. <laughs> right. yes, point, point because taken. I mean, compared to Mark Hinkle, he has been an absolute stellar chair. But he just uh, and so people like me who are not uh, uh, listen, I'm I'm a Libertarian Party person, but I'm not willing at this point in my life to spend a lot of time, you know, cleaning up the dog kennel. And uh, I just don't. And I think there are a lot of people like myself who just like are uninspired to go to New Orleans to vote for somebody who is going to keep turning out more uh, turds. I, so, I just... so, so, okay, but look at what you got here. We've got two people running for office. Do you think that the other person running against him is not going to set up more turds? He sure is dropping a whole lot of turds all over the place. He's involved with, us, with, with the Mises Caucus, with Adam Kokesh, with Marissa Hamilton. If you watch, if people watch, I'm, I went ahead and said that, that group is doing a concerted effort to make the LP the LNC look bad with the intention of advantaging them at the expense of this party and our people that are trying to get elected. We were spent, we spent last night with a motion to try and suspend our vice chair. When, when mayor of Calamasa, Jeff Hewitt, who serves as the region four rep on the LNC was on that, that conference call video conference when he was supposed to be at a ribbon cutting. With 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 a, 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 a Native American tribe, and so that's part of the things that's been wasted by this. And let's get into that whole vote last night because I think that was actually getting into it, part it, of your set question. Set that up and explain it, please. So so our vice chair has been some con- that being Arvin Boyle for the Libertarian National Committee has made um, you know some statements on on social media that have inflamed certain segments of the population. I think most um, of the population, I think they're pretty disgraceful. And I think any any rational thinking person would look at uh, equating teachers and soldiers with rapists would go, what is this person thinking? This is not a clear person think this is not a clear thinking person. And in defense of Arvin, Arvin in his time in the vice chair role has completely changed the social media game of the Libertarian Party and t- Arvin turned it around. Arvin 1.0 was much better than Arvin Vore 2.0. Right, and he's going to not be vice chair because of, of of this, and I don't understand it because Arvin 1.0, as you said, did do a lot he's of great. good. And, and so I don't understand why why our chair, A, is silent on any of this, and B, our chair and our vice chair can't take this no, so, this negative social feedback from people like myself and, and other the people that I talk to, the people in my audience, and go, maybe they're right. Maybe I should just not double down, triple down, and continue this crusade to alienate people from the party. I, I don't, I don't understand. And to me, that is a fundamental failure of leadership on so, both so, of their parts. So let, me, let me get into that, Chris, because because you know I'm you know I'm I'm a full disclosure kind of guy. And a let I me was, let, let me just say I apologize for making you defend the statements of other people. That's not your role. I fully acknowledge that. But so, if, so if, where I'm where I'm going with but this I am interested in an LNC member's I'm opinion. To, yeah, but I'm going to talk about my votes. Okay. And, and you know I serve at the will of the delegates. And somebody said, well, you need to start talking to the votes. No, listen, that means I serve at the will of the delegates. I intend to uh, att- seek to be on the Libertarian National Committee again as an at large in the same role that I have. I believe I've I've done a lot of work um, to help move the party in a positive direction. I certainly can do better. But um, I think I have a lot to offer the party. However, if our delegates no longer think that, then I will um, go back to being the local and state activist that I am and and maybe still make myself available for some of the subcommittees and stuff like that if there's something that I can help out with for the national party. Other than that, you know, my, 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 my role in the, um, the, the, the Libertarian Party is not entirely defined by being – uh, on the national committee, um, I am a local activist. I am an activist. I do. I lobby at our state capitol, and and so those things are important. But um, you know, I want, so so back to on the, the the vote that happened last night. Um, this was an ongoing topic, and and I I think people know uh, if you if you look over things, I am not happy with the statements that Arvin's been making. I do not think they are constructive. I think they are are definitely uh, a net loss. In a, in a large direction, however, 
having come from a state, when, when I joined the LP, one of the reasons why the leadership at that time, to my understanding, was trying to expand and add the, the parish executive committees was that with the way the bylaws are written, that would have put more votes on our our um, our state committee. And they there had been a, a move for about a year, and they were in a four year cycle, which that's like forever in libertarian terms. Never never go to a four year cycle for your um, for your leadership in the yeah, LP. It's but uh, but but a year into it, I came into a bunch of people that were involved in infighting, and that that whole cycle continued through that whole term and at during the last round of the infighting there were I, I i think it was 72 grievances of petty bs submitted to our ad hoc judicial committee and and you know like there was not a lot of good that came out of that so so one thing that I, I realize is when you start with with trying to remove people and go after people it doesn't stop there you know, you look at the French Revolution and Dalton threw the aristocracy on the guillotine and then they, then the, they threw him on the guillotine after that. It, it's, it's, you know, it doesn't stop, stop with one person. It's got a really strong tendency to do that. So give me a, um, give me a summation, please. Summation is, you know, I've got some lady pointing at me. Hold All right. On. All right. Yeah, I, and I fully understand give me, that. Give me one second. Yeah, sure. No, that's fine. I, I, I mean— What's that? To be fair, um, thirty minutes. Uh, let me mute him. Okay. He's uh, getting okay. in trouble with his wife for being long-winded. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm being tro tro troed out here. I, I got I got time though. I told him thirty. All right. Minutes. Yeah. So uh, this is this is I got I've got two more minutes with you here. Uh, so give me give me just a couple. Give me your final thoughts on Arvind Vora. Why why should I stay involved in the Libertarian Party? despite having a vice chair or a chair that doesn't fully represent my beliefs or behave in a way that I find uh, leader, l leader, it's not leadership. But, but, but because, because the only person that can represent you 100% is you. The Libertarian Party is a party made up of individuals that come together through voluntary association. Yes, I get the fact that, you know, some people are like, well, we want to voluntarily disassociate from Arvin. There are rules involved in that, and when you engage in discipline, it, it wouldn't be done anytime soon. It's something that's going to, it, 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 it seems like it'll make it better, but uh, my experiences have been it only makes things worse. So if you actually believe in what the party is, I mean, you know, a lot of us are, are, are fearful for liberty. This is supposed to be about liberty. And yes, you know, people claim, you know, uh, principles over party, but you got to remember, like, if somebody in my position, I am a party leader, which means I am required to be partisan. So that said, if, you, if you're unhappy with the direction and the way things are going in, step off of Facebook, get involved, do outreach with people, grow the party, this idea that we're going to do it all on, on social media from, from the comfort of our, of our homes is, is just not reality. Social media can be a great tool. It can be leveraged to an advantage. However, you know, I have jokingly referred all the time that Facebook is the devil, and somebody else actually said that the other day, and I was like, huh, funny. But, uh, you know, it can be, it, it, you know, we see what happens. It, it magnifies everything. It's, it's, like, it's like the 24-7 news cycle on steroids because people have 24-7 communication with each other, and any little thing can be spread instantly. It goes viral, and it becomes much bigger in, than, it, than it is. And un the unfortunate thing is that positive things are much less likely to go viral and be shared than something where there's some sort of controversy. It's just people like to go go look at the train wreck, and you know we've we've got to get away from that. So, so step away from your keyboards, get involved. You know it, it's very it, it is very very draining if you spend a lot of time on social media and you watch the continuous circular firing squad there are so many people that are associated as being part of the libertarian party that have maybe even never been involved with the lp they may be anarcho-capitalists or or some other vein or or whatever or they're just trolls and they people see that and they think that's what the lp is about i don't want any part of this but the thing is when you, you know and it gets very depressing when you're involved with the party 
And but but when you get out and you start doing outreach and you start dealing with, quote unquote, civilians, people that are not part of the LP, it's really invigorating. And so we need to quit fighting with the choir. We're not preaching the choir. We're fighting with the choir and go out and talk to other people out in your own community. And, Chris, I'm asking you as the de facto host, you've got a great voice. You've got a good platform uh, here with, with your program. I encourage you to come to New Orleans. You help make the party what you want it to be because only you can represent yourself. 100%. Well, I will be there. Uh, I'm going to message you Thank about you. media credentials, uh, <laughs> but I will definitely be there as I, as I move more into the media realm. But I thank you for being here. How can people find out more information on the convention? When, where, how, what website? So, so it's you have to spell it out. It's libertarianconvention.org. Um, you can also it's kind of long to, to to type out. You can also go to lp.org. Scroll all the way to the bottom of the page. Find the um, the header that says "Get Involved," and there's a link that takes people to to the national convention, um, and they can come to New Orleans June 30th through July 3rd, and we will, um, you know, basically look to have a very exciting convention. And I I'd I really like people to start focusing. You know, th look at the, think what the theme of this convention is. I'm that libertarian. People have forgotten that moment. I cannot express enough how people need to see that and if you see people that are just simply looking to divide people looking to purge people are is that really what this party needs if we are going to actually succeed as a political party we need more people in there and i get there's a whole lot of things that need to be fixed in that in that particular realm but 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 making it worse is not, not going to make it better and you know yes there's things that need to be improved with the leadership but 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 that's part of growing, and we've got a proven track record with a lot of the people that are involved in the LNC right now, including our state, uh, our national chairman Nicholas Sarwak, that 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 is inspiring confidence in major donors. We have we have more money coming into the party, and it's not just about money, but politics is a money game, and that's what's going to help us to start to compete. And so we have got to, to, to do more to bring things in. And one of the things I've taken a lot of uh, offense with with some of these other people is when they, they, they start acting like the sky is falling because I've seen it happen. I was involved with a caucus that they were doing that, and that was part of the reason why I nearly, nearly switched my boat to Nick. Um, you know, th th that sky is falling thing and, 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 and trying to put a, a magnifying glass on any and everything that's wrong and even – some things that really actually aren't wrong and mischaracterizing thing is not going to help the party. You know, it, it, people need to get get rid of this whole idea of, of, of you know, better to rule in, in, in hell as long as I'm ruling, because that seems to be what the case is. We need to try and come together on those things we agree on, because I'm that libertarian that lives here in New Orleans. I'm that libertarian that is hoping to that we put on the most successful and best convention ever. I'm that libertarian that's sure it's going to be that way i'm that libertarian that's asking everybody that is interested to come to that convention and get involved all right and thanks thank you for having me chris yeah thanks for joining us thanks for telling your side of the story and we appreciate uh, you being here daniel sure all right uh thanks for uh to daniel for coming on i uh, you know i'm gonna i'm gonna do a little analysis of this and also give you some of the roots of of these arguments, because I think it's an important. Uh, it's something that I learned years ago. The history of some of these fights, and so when you see a lot of these uh, dog kennel fights, as as Judd Weiss put it so uh, brilliantly, you kind of go, oh, "Okay, that's that thing. This is the roots of it." And sometimes things are set in motion fifty years before us, and we still enact the same behavior. And I think. Unless we understand why this stuff happens, we can't stop it because these these little uh, flame wars just come. That's why we have sliding membership. It, it truly is. Um, my take on the uh, Mises Caucus versus the convention, a after talking to him, reading all of the stuff that that Michael Heiss has put out, I do think that Daniel has some merit. Uh, and his argument has merit that. The Mises Caucus is taking advantage of a situation to uh, put out a narrative to make them look bad for political gain. 
smart politics. And we are a political party, and the idea that we shouldn't play politics is ludicrous. Uh, and that's part of the reason that this exists. This We Are Libertarians podcast, it exists to give you alternative uh, arguments so you can make up the, your mind for – and that's what we should do. We should, we should have these discussions. We should try and figure out what's going on as opposed to throwing up our hands and going, I'm not going to get involved because I don't know who's right, so I'm just going to be lazy. People look for any excuse – not to be a libertarian, not to be involved in politics, not to be in the libertarian party, uh, but and, and to be quite honest, I I completely understand the the notion that you don't want to be involved in the libertarian party uh, or any political party. That friction, that social friction of people rubbing together consistently, gets very exhausting for a lot of people. And I think a lot of libertarians are introverts, and it it, it sort of wears you down. So. That continuous argument is is very tiring. So I get it. Uh, not everybody is as combative as I. Uh, the comments on the Facebook Live are still open. I can uh, I'll glance over there and see what you're saying. So I'd love to hear what you thought of the interview, where you kind of come down between these two. Uh, what who'd you like to speak at the Libertarian Convention? Uh, obviously, Larry Sharp is a, a, a popular uh, choice in the in the chat. So. Uh, I'm going to give you the history of, of this this argument with Ron Paul, and let me uh, start by saying I I am a libertarian because of Ron Paul in 2008, and is the debates in 2008, seeing him is what made me a libertarian. I, I would say that my politics are the closest political figure is Rand Paul. Uh, I would say that uh, Rand Paul, I almost never disagree with the guy, uh, but... I do feel that there is a cult of personality around the Pauls, especially Ron Paul, that is concerning to me. And I think what we're seeing in this argument and around Ron Paul and some of this is identity politics in libertarian form. And these arguments that we're having uh, are not about policy. It's about identity politics. It's our version of it. And the litmus test has slowly become, as Ron Paul has retired and gotten older, do you support Ron Paul? Do you say anything bad about Ron Paul? Then you're not a libertarian, and I find that to be troubling. I don't, uh, I don't think that Ron Paul does anything to kind of dismiss the idea. Uh, I think he kind of relishes being worshipped, and as someone who jo is jokingly referred to on, on his own podcast as Dear Leader, I, I, I resemble that remark. Uh, but, and I'll play at the end of this just to give you Ron Paul's take, the four-minute clip that Daniel referenced, so you can hear Ron Paul's thoughts about the convention thing. And you you hear him kind of saying he's kind of stoking the fire, but he's not you know addressing it. He hasn't talked to Daniel. He doesn't really know what's going on. But am I you know he's stoking it so to get conversation about Ron Paul started. And there there are things about Ron Paul that are not always great just like any other person any other human being has flaws uh and i think the allowance of the cult of personality around himself is one of those things that i find to be an issue uh i like i said there isn't there are very few people who have done more for the libertarian movement than ron paul so don't get it wrong i i greatly respect the man i've met him he is uh, a genuinely decent human being he is a, a the person who had more impact on the modern libertarian movement than any other person. So, you know, and that should be celebrated. But he also shouldn't be a godlike figure that is not able to be criticized. If, if the libertarian party had come out and said, we fundamentally don't like that this person, this Republican congressman, continually speaks ill of our party, so we would not like to have him speak at our convention, I'm okay with that. I understand that. Uh, and there are a large section of people who go, blah, 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 you know, and it, it, look at it. Look at it from a, a reasonable perspective. Ron Paul has, since 2008, because of Bob Barr, taken a very dim view of the party, and a lot of his criticisms about the party are completely valid. And I think a lot of what Michael Hayes, Michael Hayes uh, Heiss said in his piece uh, on the Libertarian uh, Mises Caucus website is very valid, and I think there's a lot of issues. And you know, I I brought those up in the last hour. So 
Ron Paul, I think, is a libertarian hero and a libertarian icon for a reason, but I don't believe that we should uh, ever have any person in the libertarian movement that is above criticism or critical thinking. And everything that he does, like any other political figure, should be examined through the lens of what you believe so you can make the best judgment. Um, you know, so uh, a lot of this goes back to Murray Rothbard and Murray Rothbard versus the Kochs, the Koch brothers. And I don't think a lot of people really understand the history of Murray Rothbard versus the Koch libertarians. Uh, you know, Murray Rothbard was an absolute genius. Uh, he, he took the Mises uh, and the Austrian economic school to, to prominence, uh, popularized by Ron Paul's runs. I mean, they... Ron Paul, when he ran in 2008, 2012, took Mies, the Mises Institute and uh, Murray Rothbard and implemented it in most people's minds as this is libertarianism. And I do have I, I have uh, friction with a lot of uh, people who are who are absolute devotees of both because they assume that like, you know, our friend Roger Paxton and the, and the anarcho capitalists that live in New Hampshire, who ironically worship the. Republican congressman who is uh, an, a statist, <laughs> in the, by their definition, um, you know they there is this strain of thought amongst them that they are the libertarians and this is the only strain of libertarian thought that counts. I don't buy that. I think it is uh, a. I'm. I am not good with economics. Okay, I'm not. I, I I'm interested in people. I'm an ENFJ. I love people. I love how people interact. But once we start adding math to human interaction and human action, I start to go, I don't get what you're saying. So I rely on people like Murray Rothbard to to explain economics to me. And I've learned a lot. Like Anatomy of the State uh, is a very short book, very good book for, for you to read. I, I previously was anti-Mises, anti-Rothbard because of those people interactions with people and listening to Lou Rockwell, who I think is a tremendously negative person, uh, despite his work, which has benefited the libertarian movement. When I listen to his podcast, I just get depressed. <laughs> so so I, I, for a while there, didn't listen to a lot of uh, Murray Rothbard and uh, a lot of the, the Mises crowd. But Tom Woods, listening to his podcast, I think he is... Um, I love Tom Woods. I think he has taken the the negative edge off of everything and given a very positive spin and been a very good ambassador for a lot of people for the Mises the Mises crowd and uh has really reawakened my interest in a lot of Mises and Hayek and Rothbard. But Murray Rothbard was very influential and involved in the beginning of the Libertarian Party, the beginning of National Review, the beginning of the Cato Institute. Murray Rothbard, uh, you know, the betrayal of the right kind of outlines his traveling through various political circles from the beginning of the right with, you know, National Review over to the left. And it, he's a very interesting character. He's a very uh, divisive character. And I think a lot of that has to do with his personality uh, and his willingness to call it as he sees it. And. And I say divisive not in a negative way, just in that sometimes when you are so sure of the truth and so sure of what you believe, people take that personally sometimes, uh, which, you know, he may have not been uh, a dick on purpose. You hear people describe Murray Rothbard as a dick, but sometimes when you're just confident in what you believe, people take that personally, and that's that's a weird thing. Uh, so reformedlibertarian.com is is a great website I actually dis, uh, discovered in prepping for this episode and he, he this this author if I can get my fingers to work I'll tell you uh, C J G A A Y Engel is the editor and creator of the Reformed Libertarian and he wrote a summation of David Gordon's work a three-part series on uh, the relationship of Murray Rothbard with the Koch brothers and I want to read to you certain sections of this um, because I think it's really interesting because a lot of what you hear about what was happening in the 70s and 80s, we're still experiencing many years later. 
Uh, and obviously the Koch brothers are the, you know, they're from Wichita, Kansas. Their dad, uh, David, David and Charles Koch are who are usually referred to when you talk about the Koch brothers, although there's two other brothers. Uh, their dad got their interest in political and economic matters from their father, who was heavily in, involved in the John Birch Society. Uh, and they got their, their wealth from their father. During his schooling, uh, C.J. writes, Charles stumbled upon the work of Murray Rothbard and eventually decided to use a piece of his billion-dollar wealth to fund an organization dedicated to promote libertarian ideas. In fact, Charles was so enthusiastic about Murray that Murray was one of the four original stockholders of the organization, along with another important character of the story, Ed Crane. Of course, Charles was the majority stockholder. It should also be mentioned that the Koch Empire was behind the creation of Reason Magazine, the Institute for Humane Studies, Students for Liberty, George Mason University's economic think tank, the Mercatus Center, and Americans for Prosperity. Due to Koch money, and now the Charles Koch Institute, and a lot of, a lot of the things that you love about the Libertarian Party, the, the, the resources that you use have been backed by Koch money, and so... Uh, when libertarians hate the Koch brothers, I don't quite get it, but I think this article kind of explains it. Um, this began, now it's called the Kochtopus. The organization that the Koch started for the advancement of Rothbardianism and Austrianism was the Cato Institute in 1977. The name was Rothbard's idea, based on Cato's letters. Um, Rothbard was thrilled. Here was the reward for decades of tireless and lonely efforts to carry forward the dying flame of the Misesian economics. For years, Rothbard was nearly alone in his appreciation for the Austrian school and his gloriously stubborn dedication to the strict property rights theory of liberty. But finally, an organization which could host him and advance the message of the next generation. Uh, and, and I find that inspiring. I mean, here's somebody who is so dead set in their belief and stubborn in what they believe and unwilling to compromise that Rothbard's name I think will live for generations and, and and I think eventually the way that history shakes out Austrian economics will be because of technology the way that most of us live post city-state uh, government unfortunately the problem started early Charles Koch had hired Ed Crane to run the day-to-day -day operations of Cato and Rothbard to lead the intellectual and academic development Crane's pragmatism over principal mentality on the growing Cato Institute led him to both downplay the organization's goal of developing intellectual content of a libertarian think tank, the reason Cato started in the first place, and later in the story to dismiss academic contributions of Rothbard and his scholars as, mere, as a mere distraction. The head of Cato's Inquiry magazine was Bill Evers. He was berated by Crane for focusing too much on the development of ideas and not enough on gaining influence in Washington. Here we see a glimpse into the future of the pragmatist versus principle debates that flourish in the libertarian movement today. Um, in the context of this tension, and I'm skipping paragraphs for the, for the sake of time, but I will link this at wearelibertarians.com in the show notes if you want to read all of these articles. Things began to break down when Rothbard discovered that the decision had been made to hire David Henderson, who was not an, econo an economist in the Austrian school, but rather le leaned far to the Chicago school, which was best represented by uh, Milton Friedman, uh, the Chicago School of Economics, uh, University of Chicago. This was a very important event in the unfolding of his relationship, R Rothbard's relationship with the Cato Institute, because the entire mission of Cato in the first place was to give Rothbard an outlet to advance the Austrian vision. So to hire one, uh, one person from a different school, uh, put the message of Cato at odds. Um, the next step in flaring tensions was the efforts of Crane and Koch in 1980. They went all in for LP candidate Ed Clark. Ed Clark and Ed Crane are two different people, so let's keep, I'll try to keep this straight. With the Koch's money behind him, David Koch joined Clark on the LP ticket so the entire campaign could be paid for using Koch's own money. To this day, uh, the, Koch, the, Crane, the, the Clark Koch campaign is the highest get. Uh, actually, I think Gary Johnson may have beat them, but it was always the highest uh, of all the vote totals. So, you know, for it kind of undermines the argument of the purists. If we just are pure enough and give a pure message, then we we will win. Well, the most successful campaign pre Gary Johnson and all the media that he got, uh, which was why he was successful, was Clark and Cr and Coke giving a more pragmatic message. 
Um, so in short, it was, uh, and I skipped. I'm skipping an important part, but basically, Rothbard was pissed that Crane, Clark, and Koch all started to redefine libertarianism as a low tax liberal. The idea that we are, uh, you know, e economically conservative and fiscally liberal. That is uh, a direct result of this, and Rothbard didn't like that. Uh, he assailed this as a betrayal of the libertarian principle. Um, so, in short, it was due to the positioning of Hoke and Crane and the person of Ed Clark that Gary Johnson is now misconstruing libertarianism as fiscally conservative and socially liberal. Um, the underlying differences here are obvious, and therefore the problem was festering far deeper than just disagreement over a silly campaign. Rothbard emphasized and stressed the need for scholarship and developing ideas. Crane and Koch, however, sought to secure the audiences of power. Murray Rothbard's own and separate newsletter that was in print from 69 to 84, The Libertarian Forum, which you can read, uh, I think, at the Mises website. A lot of great stuff in there and all publicly available. Lou Rockwell has done a great job of preserving all of Murray Rothbard, Mises. Jeffrey Tucker played a hand in that We've in, in an interview with him. He told us he was responsible for putting up all of uh, this great material. You can get all kinds of free ebooks at Mises.org. Same with Fee. Now that Jeffrey Tucker's there, he's taken the the uh, taken the show t on the road to Fee, Fee.org, and uh, also our friends at the online uh, Liberty Library. You can get a lot of great books there too. So, um. Here was Rothbard's independent outlet, free from the chains of Cranes and the Charles Koch strict oversight of PR matters. Uh, he was able to announce the libertarian world as the true roots, uh, he writes. So um, it, it started to continually break down. And as things got worse uh, over time, Rothbard was removed from his position at Cato and no longer invited to speak, and as for the legal problem, namely Rothbard's stakeholder status, it soon became apparent to Rothbard that battling the billionaire brothers was beyond question, going to result in a tragedy for Rothbard. He would go broke. I mean, and so Crane informed Rothbard that his shares had been arbitrarily voided, and Rothbard could no longer participate in board meetings. Rothbard knew it was over, as Rothbard later accounted, Crane, uh, and he called anybody who was a supporter of Cato and Crane craniacs at the time uh, as a pejorative. Crane, aided and abetted by Coke, ordered me to leave Cato's regularly quarter board meeting. The Crane Coke action was not only iniquitous and high handed, but also illegal, as my attorneys informed them before and during the meeting. They didn't care. What's more, in order to accomplish this foul deed uh, to their own satisfaction, Crane and Coke literally a a portion uh, uh, appropriated and confiscated the shares which I had naively left in Koch's Wichita office for safekeeping an act clearly in violation of our agreement as well as contrary to every tenet of libertarian principle so this was his property and he's he left the property in Koch's office and Koch stole it and so Rothbard was wiped out clean of a stake in Cato and was no longer welcome he was uncompromisingly his uncompromising mentality and dedication to the libertarian system over and above his dedication to popularity had once again done him in um so this sets uh the <laughs> i mean he was appropriately pissed <laughs> you know that was a pretty cr crappy thing to do uh, at Cato, they remain anti-gold standard, pro-central banking, and non and anti-non-interventionism, which I don't agree with that statement. But uh, you can certainly find some of their scholars who are a lot of uh, all of those things. And anti-Ron Paul, all this because they remain anti-Rothbard. Uh, Gordon writes, as mentioned in part one, the Coctopus strategy strongly opposes the Mises Institute, which aims to continue the Rothbardian policy, policy of the Austrian economics, laissez-faire, and peace that Cato was established to promote. Uh, Reason, now under Koch patronage, did not react to Ron Paul's The Revolution. Uh, they should praise it, but they didn't, they said. So it, it, this is the, the, the beginning of the split. Uh, and for f anybody who was a friend of Rothbard was appropriately horrified by this. And then there started this feud. And so, and it's more on the side of the Misesian crowd where they are, 
th- th- that's why you will find the Ron Paul's, Mises crowd, the even Tom Woods to some extent, anti Cato, anti reason. They cause the they call them Cosmotarians. Anybody who is affiliated with these organizations, they don't they don't mess with. Uh, and reason and any Coke affiliated group doesn't really uh, spend a lot of time talking about um, any of this. I didn't understand this because I was reading Reason in 2008, 2012, going, why aren't they covering Ron Paul as much as you'd think they would? And this explains it. <laughs> so it also explains why Ron Paul uh, does not care for the Libertarian Party, uh, although he did run in 88 pre this split. Um, let's see here. The The final straw, I think, for Ron Paul was 2008. We we had nominated Bob Barr. I was not a. I, I started the Libertarian uh, Party after Bob Barr's nomination. Uh, at the time, I was still, you know, casting off a lot of my Republican beliefs, and so I was in favor of Bob Barr. Looking back and being further down the Libertarian rabbit hole, I see he uh, he was a huge mistake and really was. I, I mean. Just <laughs> Bob Barr is is he pretended for a while. He did a great job pretending that he was switching parties and a libertarian. Uh, but in 2008, in September, um, this is from Dana Milbank and the Washington Post, uh, posted at Herald dot com, Heraldnet dot com. Bob Barr goes hog wild after Ron Paul event. Now Ron Paul had given up the goat and. Uh, you know, my my official um, – I stopped being a Republican when I went to the 2008 convention in the state of Indiana. I was the only reporter in the entire state to cover all three conventions. And uh, the Republican convention at that time kicked out about 300, some say 600, Ron Paul delegates in 2008. And I just remember this woman coming up to the media stand and nobody there would talk to her. But I was I was like 23 and kind of libertarian leaning. So I talked to her and she's just weeping about how this had all how this had all gone down. And it was one of the biggest mistakes uh, talking to some party people later on in the Republican Party. They said it was one of the biggest mistakes they'd ever made because. It happened in every state convention across the nation. Ron Paul delegates were systematically removed, so they couldn't go to the uh, Washington to the main convention that year and not vote for the main, you know, for John McCain eventually and Mitt Romney. And they did it twice. I mean, I remember in 2008 and again in 2012 them illegally changing the convention rules in the Indiana State Convention to screw over Ron Paul delegates. I had county chairs because they didn't know my affiliation when I worked for a news talk radio station. They think, oh, he's in talk radio. He must be a Republican saying, oh, the second we hear somebody's a Ron Paul delegate or a Ron Paul fan, we kick them out of the party so fast. And then 10 minutes later, I remember this person saying, you should come. You should be a libertarian. You should be a Republican. You should join the party. I heard you uh, are a libertarian party person. He goes, I go, OK, how can I possibly reform the party if you're going to kick me out because I like Ron Paul? So the Republican Party uh, clearly was hostile towards Ron Paul. He was never going to get the nomination because they, the party was so corrupt. Um, and so after he didn't get the nomination, he uh, held this event in, in September, and he invited all the third-party candidates. Uh, I forget who the Constitution, I think it says it in this article. Uh, he invited Bob Barr, Ralph Nader, Cynthia McKinney, and Chuck Baldwin – to the event. Chuck was the Constitution candidate who Ron Paul would go on to uh, eventually endorse. Bob Barr, the Libertarian. Ralph Nader was, I think, an Independent. And then Cynthia McKinney, who was the Green Party. Cynthia McKinney, certifiably insane. Um, So so Ron Paul wants to elevate third-party candidates after the treatment that he got in 2008. So he puts on this event. And uh, Dana Milbank writes, Ron Paul, the Libertarian gadfly, the Washington Press never was going to give him a, a shot. Who, lon- who launched a mass movement and his failed bid for the GOP nomination convened a third-party unity event at the National Press Club today to bring Bob Barr, Ralph Nader, Cynthia McKinney, and Chuck Baldwin together into one big happy family. But as soon as Ron Paul reached out to apply to the uh, applied the Revlon to the snout, Bob Barr went hog wild, turning in, into a barnyard brawl. 
Uh, Paul told the crowd at Ballroom, I'm during the event. He is on stage saying, I'm very pleased that we have some special guests here. Three of the candidates are here with me, and I understand Bob Barr is on his way or will be here shortly. Well, not exactly. Barr, the LP candidate for president, never showed for the unity event, instead having an aide hand out notices at the door announcing that he would be making a major campaign announcement at a rival news conference in the same place two hours later. His major announcement that Ron Paul could get lost, Dana Milbank writes, uh, Barr said, I'm not interested in third parties getting the most possible votes. I'm interested in Bob Barr as the nominee for the LP getting the most votes possible. In a further insult, Barr would said he would permit the vastly more popular Paul to be his vice presidential running mate. Imagine the balls that that takes. <laughs> like, like, you don't show up to his event. Who knows if he told him he wasn't showing up. You hold an event and then say, be my vice presidential candidate. Paul partisans were appalled. Uh, I will be withdrawing my endorsement. A man identifying himself as an independent blogger declared from the audience. Me too, called out another. I was going to vote for the guy, but I think he's about as arrogant as George Bush. Uh, so third party unity didn't even last a day. Um, so and I'm trying. Uh, yeah. So really, uh, Bob Barr, I can, I can understand his not wanting to be on the same footing as Cynthia McKinney. Like, you don't want a moral equivalency between you and an insane person being made by the national press, but the way that he handled it was so insulting to Ron Paul. And uh, ever since then, Ron Paul, Ron Paul didn't give Gary Johnson a chance. By 2016, he was calling him milk toast. And, uh, you know, Gary Johnson was much more ideologically... Paulian in 2012 than he was in 2016. There was this weird thing in the Johnson campaign in 2016 where he thought he would reach out to the left and uh, Weld would re reach out to the right. And Weld, being a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, again, as I said earlier, Gary, you know, Ron Paul used to go on Alex Jones. Uh, the Council on Foreign Relations in libertarian circles is considered the driver of interventionist wars which they kind of they are i mean i i read the council on foreign relations consistently and they are always pushing the narrative of we need to um, intervene in other nations for america's security so the idea that anybody from the Misesian crowd or ron paul was that was going to endorse bill weld a ticket with bill weld was ludicrous from the beginning so that's why you get Ron Paul continually, you know, even though the ideology of the Libertarian Party and Ron Paul are the closest, that's why you see him endorse Chuck Baldwin, the Constitutional Party candidate, staying out of things in 2016. That's why you get that kind of tension between the two. So when Nick Sarwark, uh, who is a very intelligent man, who probably understands this, if I can understand it, Nick can understand it. When he when he tries to uh, slap the Misesian crowd, that's why there's such a strong clap back from that crowd towards the LP. The LP and uh, I applaud Michael Heiss and the the Mises caucus for trying to heal this rift. But I also think that they need to understand that a lot of this has to do with personalities. The Cokes screwing over Murray Rothbard in the 80s has nothing to do with our ideology, ideology now and our policies that we're trying to promote now. And the, the rhetorical argument of we need to be pure and not milk toast is a very clever way for people who agree with the Cosmotarians and the Reason crowd and the Cato crowd, 99%, let's say 90% of the time, uh, it's a clever way to keep everybody hemmed into a certain camp. Uh, and, you know, people like me come along who, who who respect both. And I think there are a majority of libertarians now, 40 years after all this happened, 30 years, going, I don't get the hostility. Why Why can't we just get along? I understand the history, but, like, Murray Rothbard's no longer alive. I don't know if Ed Clark and Ed Crane are even alive, but they're definitely not invo involved in the Cato Institute. Um, you know, there, there's, there is a fundamental purpose served by the Mises and the Cato Institute. The, the Mises Institute is that anchor that keeps us moored to pure libertarian principle. 